we're two minutes past five and we aim to finish after an hour precisely so i think let's kick off i i the for friends who are perhaps joining one of these webinars for the first time i'll just introduce uh, dr norbert Rutgen, uh briefly invite him to say a few words um for the next uh, 15 minutes or so on the the subject of the German perspective on the challenges that face Europe and how the German presidency is seeking to shape the future of the Union. And then I have a number of questions that have been submitted in advance, but could anybody else please try to uh, use the Q&A facility and we will then call on you to ask your question live using the audio facility. Um, but it, it's a real pleasure to um, uh, uh, welcome Dr. Norbert Rutgen, the Chair of the Bundestag uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. I should say, Norbert, that your opposite number, Tom Tugendhat, is on the line, um, ah. listening intently to, uh, to Hi, what you Tom. have to say. And um, uh, Norbert uh, is somebody I have, I have known and respected for quite a few years. Um, uh, and who has maintained a very strong interest in uh, international relations, You're going back to if, even before he became chair of the, the Bundestag Committee. He comes from the Nordrhein-Westfalen, uh, the largest uh, by population land in uh, the Federal Republic of Germany. He was first elected to the Bundestag in 1994 and has at various times served as legal policy spokesman for the CDU CSU parliamentary group, um, uh, federal minister for the environment uh, and for nuclear matters, um, deputy federal chair of the Christian Democrat Union, regional chair of the CDU in uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen, and since 2014 has chaired the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Bundestag in which capacity he has spoken out on subjects as diverse as China, uh, Belarus, Russia, the situation in North Africa and the Middle, Middle East. Um, Norbert, if I could invite you to speak to the group for perhaps 15 minutes and, and then we will open this up to questions. You're very welcome mm -hmm. indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, David. It's, it's, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this conversation. And I think it's just a start and not a one-off. So I think we should really uh, um, practice uh, the exchange of views because so much is going on. Now we have the new situation in Belarus. Uh, we have Lebanon um, and the entire Middle East, where, which is more and more a European case where we have to engage ourselves. We have the American uh, presidential elections. Uh, which perhaps will bring change in the White House, but will not that much change. It will much it will change the tone uh, and the rationality will be re-injected in our relationship. But our uh, the, but the substance of, of of challenges will remain, and perhaps also uh, some different views on how to engage uh, and, and, and what our policies should be. So I really appreciate. Uh, this opportunity uh, to to exchange to have a conversation on on foreign policy and on a European and German perspective. Um, perhaps if if we have a German look on on the challenges we are facing from the angle of the uh, half year presidency uh, of the European Union, I would say there are two. Uh, serious and, and complicated uh, challenges we are facing, uh, two, 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 two um, uh, groups of challenges. The one is an internal and the other is an external challenge or the, 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 the character, uh, the pattern of, of the challenges uh, I want to briefly mention. The, the internal, at the, at the center of the internal challenge uh, we are facing and we are analyzing is the internal cohesion of the European Union. This is really uh, uh, what, what matters. And we have now, since the, what we have used to call the refugee crisis, we have the, at least uh, 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 then, since then, we have the, the split on our normative identity. We have the challenge of the liberal, 
uh, rule of law understanding of uh, what the European Union and Europe embodies by governments in Hungary and also in Poland, uh, uh, which actively uh, advocate the model of illiberal democracy. And this divergence uh, about the very essence, in normative terms, what we are, who we want to be in this world, has paralyzed the European Union very much. It's the refugees, but underlying the power question, do we want to have a shift in how we practice democracy? Uh, do we want to get rid of, to a certain degree at least, of this um, um, uh, of the independence of our judicial system, the pluralism of, of the media and society? This is really what, what, what stays with us and is a, a fundamental challenge. Added to this internal challenge, in terms of cohesion, we have seen uh, as a reaction to the coronavirus challenge and crisis and uh, uh, challenge, a, a, the question of north-south divergence and cohesion. Uh, immediately after when the, 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 pan, the pandemic uh, broke out, particularly in Italy and southern countries, there was a massive, uh, uh, extremely surprising, emotional, broad disappointment in the South about the absence of Europe and the inertia, particularly of, of Germany, the egotism, a lack of help, a lack of solidarity. Uh, and this really brought in the North-South dimension uh, the European Union very close to the brink of, of breaking up. Um, we have now, as everybody knows, agreed upon the recovery package, unprecedented in scale and structure, 350 billion euros in grants never seen before. Um, and I don't, what I want to say is I'm, I have my doubts and concerns how the money will be spent. I think what we need is uh, a, a real investments uh, which can be controlled into the modernization, the economic modernization of Europe. And if it will end with a, a project which is only more or less about the distribution of money, we will not improve in competitiveness. But what we have achieved, if we, have, if we hadn't agreed on this recovery package, uh, we would have been quite close to the end of the European Union. So this shows how, how really serious the situation is. Uh, this has been avoided. Uh, we have not been finally rescued. Um, we have gained some space of breathe but the internal cohesion remains at the center and we have to work for it on both fronts, the normative front and the economic front, which is really central. The second group of challenges um, um, refers to our international role. We have been over decades a, an unprecedented success model of economic um, uh, of, 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 of economic growth, uh, improvements, uh, the, the internal market uh, it, it is seen, perhaps not that much in Britain, but across the continent as a, as a tremendous success story, even by historic terms. What now remains for us to do is to transform the internal success model into an international role for the European Union. We live in times where we see the emergence or perhaps re-emergence of great power politics. We see a, a focus uh, close to obsession in the United States with China. We see perhaps a shift of gravity to the Pacific. We have uh, the conflicts in the Middle East and there is no country left which will serve our interests. Uh, as it was in the Cold War time. So either the European unions step up to uh, their pursuit of their interests and values, or we will become more or less irrelevant in this period, a historic period where international order and the distribution of power is reshaped and fought among uh, main uh, powers. Um, I, I do not consider this to be 
uh, possible to forge a, Euro, a foreign policy among the level uh, between the 27 member states. Uh, but I think it's absolutely important to found and forge a group of the able and the willing. And this is not a, a, a matter of the institutions uh, in Brussels, but it has to be done on the intergovernmental level. And it should include not only EU members, but it should reach out. What, for example, is at the heart of a group which, um, which um, devotes itself to practicing foreign policy, to set up an agenda consisting of three, four important terms. I think this group, which should consist of Germany, of France, of Britain, and if we uh, try and succeed, we should get uh, Poland also into this group, perhaps, and it should be open to everybody to join. I think if Joe Biden becomes the next president of the United States, he will confront us with a clear list of expectations where Europe should uh, contribute more uh, to the international architecture. We have to respond to that. Britain has to be respond, Germany particularly, the two of us yeah. will have to respond. I think what we need uh, desperately is a, chi a European China strategy. It would be better to have an, an American, a Western, not an American, a transatlantic, a Western strategy on China. It's, it's futile to deal on China as a, as a European member state. Uh, because we are not strong enough, but unity means strength, and our interests are not that divergent, perhaps to some degree with the exception of Germany, because we are uh, economically so exposed in trading with China, but also it's only less than 10%, 7% of our uh, international trade. So at the end of the day, also we need a European China strategy where we should have to work. And the Middle East will remain and will be seen, particularly by the United States administration, both Democratic or Republican, as a European neighborhood matter, as it is this, the case with the Eastern European neighborhood. So the demand, the requirements to serve our own interests, to pursue our interests and values, uh, and the assessment of great powers uh, will leave us by either taking up this challenge not in the institutionalized way of Brussels, but by those who are able and willing to forge an interest group for our values and, and uh, uh, interests, or we will uh, fall apart and pursue our uh, small uh, national foreign policies. It was, uh, uh, on, uh, I think, the most important point in the planning of the German Chancellor for uh, our presidency was the European China summit in order to uh, organize a, a unified uh, um, European stance vis-a-vis -vis China and to get engaged on a European level with China. Uh, due to the corona crisis, this was not possible. However, we have to uh, continue our internal debates what this um, China policy really consists of. Also in Germany, we have, to, we, have to, we have to further discuss this topic. The old German, the traditional German-China policy has seen traditionally uh, the, the huge market where we have to take our place and we have to be successful there. I think this is not enough any longer. We have to see China as a major perhaps the major geopolitical challenge in the, in the future time, the time and years ahead. And uh, uh, in, in this assessment, we should deal with China on a, on a clear European stance, uh, not in any kind of hostility, not by embracing a new bipolar world or a new Cold War, but by uh, shaping uh, this relationship due to the modern requirements in the time we live in. Perhaps I leave it with that. Norbert, thank you very much indeed. I mean, there, there was a, a huge amount packed into uh, a very short uh, address. It's given us lots of, uh, of cause for thought. Um, and I was fascinated by what you said about the, 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 the grouping of the, the able and willing uh, extending beyond member states as well, because I think that that 
helps to indicate to members of this group that there is an appetite amongst our friends in other European democracies to look for ways in which we can start after the end of this year and whatever comes then to rebuild the sort of constructive but strategic relationship between the United Kingdom and the other democracies of Europe that, that it is in all our interest, I believe, to, to establish. Can I go first, please, to Alan Meekings and after him and Robert's answer, I shall go to Lord Kirkhope. Hello, Norbert, can you hear me? I can hear you, I can't see you, but I can hear you. <laughs> uh, Norbert, uh, thanks very much for those really insightful thoughts. Uh, I completely agree with you uh, when you say unity is strength. So in this context, how does Germany see the, the relationship between the UK and the EU developing in future across the board? So commercially, politically, in security terms, environmental terms, and so on. We, we, we use a phrase, if we are asked that in, in, on the, on the domestic, in the domestic conversations and by the domestic presence on, uh, we have a phrase which is generally accepted. We want as close a relationship as possible. And particularly when it comes uh, to foreign and security policy. Um, and to be honest, uh, there is, perhaps a slightly growing doubts. Uh, is, it, is it really what we want to have on both sides? Or is it, a, so we want, we would prefer to have a structure. We, we know that, that uh, Britain has left the structured way of cooperation, the integration, uh, but I think we should not only pick this issue or th that issue, but we should demonstrate that um, uh, that we are affected by the major challenges of our time uh, in the same way, and that we uh, that we really seek to find common answers uh, in order to get stronger uh, by by uh, in in the pursuit of our interests. So what what we really would like to see is as a demonstration of our unified will to respond to the challenges that we find some way some kind of structured cooperation as an expression of our will uh, to have uh, to have a will to shape international politics post brexit thank you very much indeed i'm told that uh, lord lord kirkhope hasn't hasn't actually been able to join the meeting yet so i'm going to jump to uh robert morland um also a former UK member of the European Parliament. And, and Robert, if you'd like to put your question when Simon has linked you in, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. I can. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, well, my question really follows what you said about the relationship uh, bringing in other countries on foreign policy, because in that context, uh, are you disappointed that in the negotiations between the UK uh, and the EU that there really has been very little done on the political declaration and particularly on the uh, cooperation on foreign policy? Yes, um, yeah, of course, there is uh, uh, some disappointment um, because our wish, at, in any case, perhaps our hope, our wish certainly, uh, and I'm speaking of Germany, of course there are differences. It's, it's not entirely the same picture, for example, in France. Uh, but in Germany, uh, we are really hoping that after Brexit, which let's say 80% in our society hasn't understood why you could have come to this conclusion. But people have accepted that the decision has been taken. I would that that, that the proposal that now post Brexit, uh, w w the, the world more or less remains the same, and the challenges, the disorder, the unraveling, uh, is affecting the uh, the entire European uh, uh, countries. So uh, if if uh, and so there is a clear wish what we want to have a cooperation, a close cooperation, particularly. 
uh, in the field of uh, foreign and security policy. And we haven't heard anything about this, that this is, that, um, that, there, that there is fertile ground uh, for our wish on the other side of the channel. Um, and perhaps the wish seems to be stronger to uh, uh, relish the new independence and uh, the new control uh, w which has come back uh, to Britain. So uh, we are still wishing and hoping for the same. Thank you. Can I move please to Keith Best? Right, there we are. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for a wonderful tour d'horizon um, about uh, foreign policy. It, it was most enlightening. Uh, I, I have two questions about two different countries, but they're <laughs> simple ones in so far as the way they can be expressed. Um, and that is what should be or could be uh, the relationship of the EU, first with Russia, uh, which can be seen, I think, by many as frankly a greater threat than China. We know about Huawei, but we also know uh, about Russia's involvement in very surreptitious ways uh, with our elections, um, with cyber security, uh, with this ghastly business of trying to eliminate uh, opponents, which seems to have a recent ex example. Uh, and, and it's on our doorstep. And, you know, the, it, it is a major energy supplier. Uh, how should we deal with the Russian bear, bearing in mind that they've got, frankly, uh, an autocrat in charge who's just as dominant, it seems to me, as uh, Xi Jinping is in, in China? And the second one is about Iran. Uh, at the moment, the EU has a separate policy towards Iran from that of the United States. It looks as though the US administration, certainly until November, is likely to harden. It's certainly not going to soften its attitude towards Iran. How far should the EU or can the EU have a separate policy altogether towards Iran from that of the United States? Yeah, thank you very much for, for these remarks and questions. Um, unfortunately, uh, regarding Russia, my view is that the relationship is entirely stuck. Um, but those, neither side has a clue how to achieve progress. Russia is a reality for us, so we have to deal with Russia. We thought there would be a way of modernization, both economically and politically. Uh, my view is that uh, some time ago, when Ukraine decided to go west, Putin uh, eventually has come to the conclusion there is uh, he has to take a choice. Either he will reform uh, economically, then he will uh, put his grip on power into question, or he stays uh, in power and then he has to give up uh, the the uh, the ambition to modernize the country, so he has shifted his legitimacy for his power, not by uh, the promise of of modernization and economic growth, which is the China model of staying in power, um, uh, but instead he has uh, succeeded in stirring the new Russian nationalism and has done for some time quite well, and he has been quite successful in demonstrating that Russia is back again, uh, that the times of humiliation and decline is over, and Russia is back again on eye level uh, with uh, the United States and, of course, with the Europeans, which uh, are not taken seriously on, on in, in power, in sheer power terms by, by Vladimir Putin. So he is stuck. The, 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 uh, he lives on uh, the uh, uh, sale of uh, energy resources. There is extremely little... Uh, econo I would say non-economic modernization. It's only military power politics in the eastern, in the in our eastern neighborhood or the western neighborhood, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and others, and in the Middle East, Syria, and now stretching out even to Libya. Um, 
so I think we have to, it's a matter of time. I do not have a solution either how to achieve progress with Russia. I think we should not be naive. Some are always calling for the lifting of sanctions without any shift and change in the Russian policy. You mentioned Navalny, uh, uh, the, the uh, intoxication uh, of him quite recently. Uh, I think it's, we have to be, it's again, we have to stick together. Uh, uh, I think the unified position on sanctions has massively impressed Vladimir Putin. Uh, we should uh, support uh, the transformation of Ukraine. Uh, we should express our solidarity uh, with the people of Belarus without making it a foreign policy case, because this would uh, deliver the a pretext for Putin perhaps to uh, intervene, because he will say then it's not, it's not an internal matter any longer because the European uh, countries again have made this a case of foreign policy which we cannot accept. So it's, it's little progress there um, um, in this relationship uh, and, and we will have to stay the course. I, and it's not very ingenuous to say but I think some, it, sometimes it needs, it needs simply time uh, to, uh, to, to wait for, a, for, an, for an opportunity. Iran, no, I think, and honestly, unfortunately, or I don't know, unfortunately, but honestly, I think there is no way still for the Europeans to pursue any kind of separate Middle East uh, and Iran policy without the United States. We are interdependent. I would say it has the situation has changed in that way that also the United States are not any longer neither interested nor able to pursue a Middle East and Near East policy for themselves. They have lost the interest because the oil question yeah. uh, is not any longer relevant for them. Uh, it's, uh, so, but we have, we have really to come to, to bring our, uh, um, our sides together in order to wield influence there. If, if we stay apart on Middle East, Iran, nuclear and regional questions, uh, the beneficiaries will be Turkey, Russia, uh, even China to some degree. Um, but we have to come together because neither side is strong enough uh, to, to, to wield sufficient influence. This is one hope. I think, which, which we can uh, attribute to a change in the White House. Thank you. Uh, Tom Tugendhat. Norbert, hello to you. Tom, good to hear you. See you again. Um, yeah, I'm very interested by your views on Iran, and broadly speaking, agree with them, but I'll save my response for, 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 for a time when I'm under being grilled by your <laughs> side rather than the other way around. Um, <laughs> You can count on that. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me raise it out a little bit onto an area that you have, a, I know, a very strong area of expertise in, which is the Turkish question, uh, an area you devoted a lot of questioning to. And at the moment, of course, we're seeing an increased tension between Turkey and Greece and the recent involvement in the United Arab Emirates in that region. I was wondering if you could just talk to me a little bit about, talk to us a little bit about it and how you see the events developing. Yes, this is a very unfortunate development with Turkey. It, it's, it's mostly, and I would say only related to the, 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 to the power question, to the domestic power questions. question. Uh, Erdogan is, is among those who have decided that the disadvantage of democratic election is that you can lose the election and lose the, your, your stay in power. So he, he has decided not to leave power and his office, and he has left our democratic and European values. Nevertheless, I think we have to, we have to uh, deal on the basis of mutual interests with Turkey. Turkey is economically dependent on Europe, and we have a strategic interest in Turkey. If Turkey, uh, um, uh, contributes to uh, chaos and disorder and conflicts in the Middle East. Uh, it will be to the 
to the detriment uh, of Europe. So there is a, in, now an only, not any longer a values-based, but an interest-based relationship we should have with Turkey. Regarding the Eastern Mediterranean, um, I, th I think Turkey, it, it's not yet a, a re not really an economic uh, question, not yet, because the gas and oil price is so low that, uh, that exploiting the uh, gas uh, reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean is not an, ec an economic case for some years. Uh, but of course, Turkey wants to demonstrate that the exploitation of these uh, gas uh, reserves cannot be done without the participation of Turkey. And this should, or should be done. It's, it cannot be resolved neither by, of course, military means, nor by only legal means. But you have to come to a political agreement and the distribution of the gas reserves which are uh, located there. Uh, and I think this is the only way we can do that. So I would to some extent also blame the Europeans for a lack of engagement and also the Greece for only sticking to the legal point, which will obviously not politically uh, suffice and uh, be enough for, for an agreement in that region. region. There is a, a political and objective interdependence we have to politically uh, match with. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Nicholas McLean. Uh, I wonder if I could ask you two questions. One, how do you view the relationship between Russia and China? Do you see it as an unwritten alliance? or uh, uh, is it more transactional? Because uh, in the case of South Asia uh, or Iran, uh, they, they don't see eye to eye. And the second question is German defense policy. Over what sort of period do you expect Germany uh, to reach the 2% target of GDP in defense spending? Mm -hmm. And could you comment on uh, the US withdrawal of troops from Germany? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, China-Russia certainly is a complicated um, uh, alliance of interests, mainly forged and kept together by the addition uh, of common enemies and adversaries. Uh, Russia, for certain, is the junior partner in this relationship, and with little... Um, uh, amount of um, uh, 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 of, of um, being um, now. What is the word for it? Uh, uh, China was not very uh, um, nice in 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 their deal, but China played out its strength, and the economic deals uh, are, are not very uh, attractive for Russia. But Russia was forced. Uh, to engage uh, in the deals, in the uh, sale of resources, oil and gas. Uh, the the, the uh, missile program, the nuclear missile program uh, initiated and deployed by China is also a threat for Russia. So this is a very complicated, fragile relationship based on um, uh, the commonality of being an authoritarian, anti-liberal, anti-Western political model, sharing by this um, the uh, rivalry with the United States and the Europeans, but certainly uh, with uh, Russia as the junior partner in decline and the rising power uh, uh, China. Um, however, the, the particularly the, the American policy brings them closer together, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it, they are not really friends, but it's more the enemy of my enemy uh, policy there. Um, then you asked, sorry for not taking a note on question two and three, the, the defense budget. We have, so we certainly have uh, done a very bad job 10 years before when we took the peace dividend in unresponsible uh, 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 dimensions. 
we have turned uh, our fiscal policy on defense now for four or five years. So we are at in this budget at around about 40 billion spending on euro, euros spending on defense. This is more or less 1.4% of GDP, but it's quite an amount. Uh, we have to stick to that. It will become with the Social Democrats more complicated to agree on a uh, on an increased defense budget. I, it's not will not be easy with the Greens as well. However, I would say the Greens are going to the center uh, in the fields of and partly have really entered the center in uh, foreign and security policy. Uh, the Social Democrats are going to. Um, the, fr the left fringes of uh, foreign and security policy. So they are, they are in the pre Keir Starmer period in, in Germany, and we will have to see who is following then uh, after the next elections. Um, so I think that a defense policy, particularly after a change in the White House end of this year, will be on the uh, on the top list of what a new democratic good partners administration will demand from germany to be done uh, and it will be a topic of uh, controversy in germany uh, but um, i think uh, i'm quite optimistic that the cause of modernization and further investment will not be left and can be continued uh, in the next uh, coalition. I'm, I'm quite positive on it. Perhaps not in the pace I would like to see, but the direction will be uh, uh, uphold. Thank you. Uh, Mark Boliat. Um, thank you, David. It's looking increasingly likely that any trade deal between Britain and the EU is going to be minimal. And indeed, that's the basis on which I think most businesses are currently working. Uh, we know this will have significant adverse effects, both in Britain and the EU. Uh, how's the position currently viewed in Germany? And perhaps that's important. Is it really now a high priority, given all the other issues that are having to be dealt with? I think it's a... It's now the priority in the programme of the Chancellor as uh, the half-year EU uh, president. Um, it was the recovery package. Uh, the EU's uh, China summit, uh, in a way, has um, has not uh, has turned out not to be manageable uh, in this Corona times. And to achieve a a a deal based on a rational analysis of our mutual interests, which, from a German perspective would not put fisheries at the center of the global challenges of the 20, early 21st century. For example, I think there are even more important problems and challenges than fish. Um, and uh, you, you really can rely on a, a, a well uh, benign minded personal position of the chancellor and of her deal-making qualities. Um, and I think she's really determined to do her best uh, to find a compromise as good as possible under the pressing uh, and complicated circumstances. What she definitely wants to avoid is that whatever uh, has been achieved or not achieved is that a a spirit or a, an atmosphere of acrimony uh, will be left and will be a lasting burden in our relationship uh, and an obstacle in really uh, facing together the challenges we are all uh, affected by. Thank you. I, I have six other colleagues down already. I shall try to squeeze everybody in if I can and if, if others still want to ask questions, please do, but uh, given the numbers, it might not be possible to get everybody in. Tim Skeet, please. Uh, yes, good evening. Very quickly, uh, of course, 
I think most of us on this call see Germany as the, the last pragmatist standing, um, which is a position we once felt we held and we've lost, uh, we've given it away with the fish, I think. Um, uh, as for the, uh, the, the question I had is, we, we're faced with the problem of Belarus next, which comes back to Russia. What are we to do with Belarus? It's, it's another right on our doorstep. And of course, the EU has every opportunity, along with the UK, to fail this particular test. I was going to ask about um, the, uh, the Russian pipeline, the Nord, uh, Nord Stream. Uh, that's where, again, you've been very pragmatic in the face of American hostility. And the third question, will Germany remain as pragmatic on China as you appear to be, unlike the UK? Mm -hmm. um, Belarus. Um, I think so far the, the European stance came with a delay, but then was absolutely, I would say, uh, a recognition, a policy of no recognition uh, elections, um, uh, individual targeted sanctions, and an appeal for dialogue. And this also means we should refrain from making the Belarus case a, a matter of foreign policy. Uh, unfortunately, deliver uh, the pretext for Putin uh, to to perhaps intervene by himself militarily, because then he can say, "Look, the the Europeans explicitly said this is a matter of of foreign policy." They do not respect the other countries and their integrity and sovereignty. So we have come to defend uh, the integrity and sovereignty because Lukashenko, the elected president, is calling us. So we, sh we should refrain. We should express our solidarity and we should, we should not divert our attention if we don't, if we, if we after two weeks or so, uh, put a blind eye on the situation, then uh, Lukashenko will come away and then he will be uh, in the best um, 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 in, 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 he will then be uh, like as, as Putin always uh, wanted Lukashenko to be extremely weak, totally dependent uh, on Russia. So I think this is the way we should, yeah. we should deal with it. Take view on China. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the traditional German policy in, in, in industry export strategy. This was how we have been used to deal with China, to see China as a market. Uh, I think this is not enough any longer. And I, for example, I, my, I'm engaged and I've delayed a contrary decision to that so far. Uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor that uh, we should opt for a European solution in building up our 5G network. This is our digital nerve system. It's about our technology, technical leadership, our, uh, uh, our economy, but it's about security and independence. Because if you let in, in the German uh, the, 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 the state and the Communist Party, because it's absolutely clear that every and particularly such important companies have to serve the state interest, party interest, and may come to any kind of international conflict in the South China Sea or wherever. The Chinese certainly will say, us then, we want to continue our good relationship. You want to do even better your 5G, but please refrain, refrain from any engagement in this conflict uh, because this will worsen our relationship and it will not be uh, and you will not benefit from doing so so in order to uh, remain digit digitally sovereign and as far as we can in an inter interdependent world um, uh, uh, independent together with our friends for example i think we should be become more realistic in dealing with china the China of Xi Jinping, we should be realistic, also pragmatic, but the China of Xi Jinping is not the China we have used to see before. Yeah. It's internally much more suppressive, very sophisticated, in a very sophisticated way, and it's, it's, uh, it's um, um, ambitious, assertive, and uh, abroad. Um, it's, uh, again, no hostility, but realism, 
what China is and what threat it, um, it uh, uh, poses for us and how important technology in this relation is also a matter of power competition. It will not be based on military capacities so much, but the advance progress in technology will be absolutely. Thank you. John Preston. Have we got John here? If not, if we're struggling uh, with that, and what John was asking is um, uh, going back to the subject you raised uh, at the start of your comments, Norbert, the presidency tackled the problem with increased discord both within and between the 27. Yes. And is it, po is it possible to do that in a way that modifies the EU itself to make it more attractive, not just to the UK, but to other states, for example, Serbia and Serbia. her neighbors in the Western Balkans? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to make it more, yes, more attractive. I think, yes, the power of, of Attractivity and attractiveness is is really important, and this really um, uh, depends on our ability to overcome these major splits. Um, it's both. Uh, China has, of course, sensed the divisions and has founded the group of the six. So. Uh, Donald Trump has engaged in the Brexit debate and uh, shown his on which side he has his sympathies, and so on, and so on. Um, so to overcome the divisions is absolutely existential for us, and it's not attractive to be divided uh, uh, both on, on, on values and, and uh, the economic uh, competitiveness. competitiveness. Um, so, but it, it's, it's, it's hard to deal with that, I have, I have to admit. Um, uh, my my personal view is that the most uh, one of the most attractive uh, uh, things in, in politics is success. So we simply have to deliver success. In that sense, the recovery package is the delivery of success. We have shown able to come to results, and I think we have to say to do the same when it comes to give an answer to many external threats we have now discussed from Iran, China, Russia, the European order. Uh, so I think it, if, if, we, if we could bring together strength, uh, 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 it would correspond uh, the degree of attractiveness. Thank you. Patrick Lerlein. Hello. Yes, so um, my question is about China, and I would like to know if the change of direction under Xi Jinping has, um, which has led people like me who used to work in China and in political areas, we've completely given up hope on uh, any establishment uh, of a more rule-based order, including particularly the, um, the respect for its own citizens. I just wanted to know if the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung is still able to operate in the country, and if so, if you're able to talk about it, I understand there may be some uh, because I think it would be quite interesting for us to learn from its work. Yes, yeah. I know that uh, the uh, activity of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung has been forbidden explicitly and uh, has been made illegal um, by the Chinese state. And uh, it's some time ago I had a, a conversation about that with my uh, counterpart, with our um, former counterpart, uh, Madame Fu was the yeah. Foreign Affairs Committee uh, in the uh, uh, People's Congress. And her answer was very frank and telling. She said, I, I, can't, I can't, yes, it's right, you're right, we have made the activity illegal, and I can say you why. Because we do not share the values of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. We have different values. We 
uh, advocate and um, uh, uh, appreciate your model of democracy. We do not hold for uh, the better system which, uh, which uh, puts the individual uh, at the center. Uh, we have more appreciation for the collective values and this is the reason why we do not want to have an organization with the wrong values in our country. So very clear where I do not know whether in the meantime uh, we have again an allowance because it has been an obstacle in our relation to this decision, not allowing to be the Colorado Steph to be there. I will I will inquire how the situation now is. I'm I'm a little bit embarrassed that I'm not I'm not absolutely sure. I think uh, the situation has not will have to inquire how the situation is. Thank you. It's uh, brought back memories of dealing with Madame Fu Ying when she was the uh, yeah. for, for, for some years till, till yeah. 2010. Um, very charming exponent of her government's line. Um, it's interesting that that's, that has hard, her line has hardened the government's line as yeah. last. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and this is interesting. I yes. have been, uh, may I say this, I have been traveling to China at least since 2009 when I became mm. Federal Minister for the Environment and Climate. Um, and what I have uh, witnessed and observed is that in, in the last years, two or three perhaps, before then the conversations were perhaps controversial, but it was interesting to listen. Mm. Now you only have the party speak, the speech mm -hmm. and, uh, and language. Mm -hmm. You have the, 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 always the same argumentation, no individual thinking. So it has really totally changed in, in having conversations with Chinese uh, interlocutors. Yes, yes. It's very interesting. Uh, Elizabeth Laird. Hi, um, so to turn back, use internal challenges for a moment. Could you speak more about the, how the German presidency will use the next few months to shape EU policy? And with so many policy priorities getting sidelined a bit by the coronavirus, what the presidency's key priorities are for the next few months? I would say the key, the, 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 I would say Brexit is number one now for our presidency. Package was a, a, a big, big deal and ordeal to come through with. I think realistically, perhaps there will be taken some steps uh, uh, in the implementation and the rule we want now to implement this because the concerns and worries uh, will not be uh, at the end of the day only a money distribution uh, agreement and, and machinery. Uh, they, they are widely shared. Um, say the, the recovery package was what we achieved, a few steps perhaps. I would say, honestly, the Brexit is a topic and I think there will not be many other surprises of and initiatives we are going to see, unfortunately. Perhaps a little, no, Libya is, it's, no, I would, I would, you know, you, you never know the surprises, Belarus was not on the table two months ago or so. Um, we have the Navalny case, Libya is, but I would, no, I would leave it with that. I think Brexit is perhaps uh, a, a, to be left for the chancellor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Liz Spencer. Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, two brief questions, if I may. They may invite longer answers than we have time for. I'm intrigued by your observations on intergovernmental cooperation and follow up foreign uh, with those who are members of the EU and those with pressure or not. Do you have any thought institutionally? Is there an existing one you can see this world or 
do you have another idea? And secondly, uh, any expectations from the presidency on launching in the future and the role of the veto that might come out of it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, what I consider to be extremely important regarding the group and the, the group approach is that we just agree on doing it for a will among crucial important countries and then start with one or two projects whatever um, and then we should by but while doing together policy perhaps targeting start with stabilization in in iraq or uh, so you have to decide where you start but we should start visibly somewhere and then we should in parallel um, think about how to establish some ways of uh, staying in contact have a contact group have meetings which give from capital to capital um, but we should achieve something in, in each terms because of serious counter arguments to this approach and the one and most serious is that this group approach will lead to a two tire European Union a first class and a second class the first class doing the important countries doing foreign policy and then the left uh, the, the 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 rest which is left with the ordinary business where we are split and not much is going on so i think this is very important to take into consideration in the way you do it you have i think there is no alternative so we have to ensure progress and success. then try to achieve something in concrete terms and step by step perhaps very cautiously uh, develop um, develop some kind of structure um, over time Thank David, you. I, 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 sorry, may, may I say, I, I, I have, to, unfortunately, yes. I have to go to a TV debate, so I have to That's be fine. quite sharp. That's fine. On seven, I think I we, will, we, will, we will bring it to a close then, and I want to, apologies to those who are unable to, you know, we come, there's no apology, because we covered a vast range of questions, and I did not say in my early earlier introduction that of course Dr. Hurtgen is a candidate for the leadership of the CDU in the con taking place. I find it quite extraordinary that at that time he's prepared to give up an hour to speak to a group of people vote in that <laughs> election. I think no, but that's a that is a tribute to you your standing and firm commitment to yeah. a constructive relationship between our two countries and all of us would like you and we would be cheering you in person if we could but it will have to be an online thanks and could i say to to colleagues meeting uh will be a webinar on the 2nd of september wednesday next week meeting the economic challenge of climate change full of environmental social and governance and the city and the speakers will be john gummer lord Deven, former uk environment minister and Sir Roger Gifford, Lord Mayor of the City of London. So 6.30 p.m. So via the CGE website. And anybody listening who's not a member uh, and would like to join the group, again, please visit the website at conservativegroupforeurope.org.uk and we welcome new members. And I think this evening will have given us the flavour of uh, how interesting uh, the subject discussions uh, is. So I'll close the meeting now. But my warmest thanks again to uh, Dr. All the thanks best. Thanks and pleasure on my side. Thank you and all the best. And looking forward to seeing you. Bye bye. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye. bye Wonderful. Bye.